Um, hi, I'm going to be talking about a day in the life um, of an F1, um, so what to generally expect. I know that it will be different kind of from ward to ward and from specialty to specialty, um, but we'll just talk through a kind of usual day when you're not on call um, and it will be either sort of 8 till 5 for surgery, so ATM start unfortunately, or 9 till 5 or 6 if you're on medicine, so a little bit later start. So this is just what kind of a typical day looks like. Um, so you start with kind of a prep for ward round or a handover. Again, as I said, bear in mind that this can kind of vary. Um, generally for the medical jobs, you tend to do quite a bit more prepping, um, whereas quite often with the surgical jobs, you tend to have a big handover altogether. Um, and then you will then start the ward round. Um, we'll talk in detail through each point as we go through the presentation. Um, but generally for the ward round, it will be either you, um, you and a consultant, a whole team, um, but as I said it does just vary, so kind of see what happens on the day um, and try and be as kind of flexible as you can. Um, there will also be kind of after the ward round a kind of handover with consultants and quite often the rest of the multidisciplinary team. Um, Again, this is more a medical thing rather than a surgical thing. Um, so a good tip for that would be to make sure that if you are on a surgical ward round, grab the nurse that's looking after the patients to go around with you because um, then it kind of just saves time in terms of handing over um, and means that they're a bit more up to date with what's happening as well. Um, lunch, arguably the most important part of the day. You need to make sure that you are hydrated, that you've had enough to eat. Um, there's loads of places you can go, um, which again we'll go through, um, but do make sure you don't skip your lunch and try and go elsewhere as well and um, don't just kind of sit in the doctor's office otherwise you'll begin to hate it and if someone's cooked something dodgy it will stink um, jobs obviously you kind of try and crack them through throughout the day um, good to make a list make a list all together um, and then try and kind of delegate so you get it all done um, and then you need to prep for handover and um, ready for the on-call team um, and then go home um, and make sure you go home on time if you don't you need to be exception reporting um, but again we'll talk about that in a little bit so um, the prep for the ward round, as I said, this can kind of vary job to job. Um, I did a general surgical job and you tend to do a little bit less prep because it was more a big team um, handover. But whereas when I did my medical job, um, you do try and do kind of a bit of prep. Um, one of the really important things to check is check what bloods are in the bloods in the FLEBS folder. Um, so know what bloods are out today, what bloods you need to chase. Um, and also it's your last minute chance to kind of sneak in some bloods if you know that um, you need them done for that day. Um, as a heads up, the FLEBS aren't massively keen. If you kind of remember a bit later on and try and give them whilst they're on their round, um, it can be a little bit tense if you do do that. Um, FLEBS can do um, the group and save forms, just make sure that you've fully labelled them, but they don't tend to be able to do kind of blood cultures and BBGs, um, but you tend to do them sort of for more acutely unwell patients anyway, so that's something you'll probably be doing. Um, another thing as well is obviously make sure that you've labelled all of the bloods with the date on, otherwise they won't be done at that time. Um, and again, the flubs can get a little bit aggy about that, so make sure it's all done properly. A good thing to do as well is make sure at the start of the day you have a communal dubs list. Um, sometimes the wards will have a template for this, you can talk to the ward clerks so you can even just make one yourself um, but if as soon as you kind of start it get it going straight away because then you kind of know where you stand um, and you can kind of predict the day a little bit better which works a lot easier um, and then also print the handover list so this should be um, again available on the kind of desktop but if you need a bit of a hand the ward clerk can help um, the only person I would just say just watch the consultant some consultants really like to save the trees which is completely understandable and don't want you to print it, print it so just make sure you gauge it from consultant to consultant so this is just a um, group and save form. It usually is a bright pink, but it's not come up as well on the slide. Um, the main column you need to focus on is the column on the right. So you need to be doing the patient's NHS number, their patient number, their last name, their first name, their date of birth. Um, you need to make sure, check and double check that these details are correct. It's really important. Um, but don't worry because I have put my date of birth on it before by accident and they will just call you and you can always go down to correct it. Um, the side on the left for the signing, um, so if, you've, if you're requesting it, you put your name and sign it there. But then if you also take it, then you sign the side on the right as well. But obviously if FLEBS are doing that, then they'll sign that. Um, and just make sure that you take the bit for group and save. Um, and that's all kind of hopefully pretty self-explanatory. Um, just be aware as well, obviously, in kind of the COVID times, sometimes we are double bagging. Um, make sure that you just check what the procedures are for the ward that you're on at the time um, to make sure that it's all in line with the kind of infection policy. So the ward round. So that's probably one of the most important parts of the day. Um, it's 
sites where you get to review all the patients um, and it as I said before it can take a kind of variety of different formats um, generally on surgical ward runs you will have a consultant or a reg with you at all times so you tend to take a kind of more scribe role um, whereas on some of the more medical jobs you will be kind of writing the jobs in and, and making your own plans um, but don't worry you're not going to be expected to kind of review the really complex patients or if you are there will always be a senior that's there that can, you can talk to and kind of ask questions. Um, Everyone has their own way of writing it. I'm sure you'll all have been taught kind of a certain way at med school. The main thing is just make sure you've got the salient points. Make sure it's clear, write and document things properly. Make sure you've got the date, the time, your title, the consultant's name. Um, if you don't know how to spell it, ask. It's so much better to work out early days how to spell it rather than just kind of ad libber spelling. Doesn't work well and um, doesn't go down well. Um, what we tended to do in terms of ward round is that if you try and get a computer or an iPad, they're generally kind of quite available, is kind of have one of you as a scribe um, and then one of you kind of looking up medications, news scores, blood results. Um, so then you can write them in and document them all in as well. Um, Arguably the most important part is the plan, um, especially on surgical ward runs when they can be a bit quicker. You need to know what's going on with this patient, kind of are they going to be discharged, if so when, where do they need to go, what follow up do they need to so kind of when the, fir the first few ward rounds you kind of won't really be sure what you need to ask but you do quite quickly become accustomed to kind of saying you know if surgeon says right home tomorrow you'll then say okay like when, when is their follow up clinic, what else do they need to do and make sure that all the other teams are all kind of involved in the right way as well. I guess the rest of it is pretty kind of self-explanatory. Just try and be quite concise. I try and tend to do a little kind of past medical history on one side and make sure that you've got the kind of the key issues, you know, if their bloods are deranged or if they're not open in their bowels, that they, you've got the issues and it's so that people can see. Um, and it's quite nice then as well for the on-call teams who, where it might not be their base ward, so they don't really know the patient as well, as well if you've done like a really nice little um, sheet and it's all neat and tidy. So this is just an example um, sheet, how some of us tend to write it. Um, one of the big things to look at there is the days post-op. That can be really helpful. It kind of lets you know whereabouts the patient should be. Um, um, kind of gives you a bit more clue towards discharge and then also means that you can keep a bit of a track of things. Um, with these kind of varying times and the fact you know there's all the COVID stuff going on if you are in a COVID ward or if you are with a patient who is query COVID or has a te uh, has tested positive for COVID, I'd also write down the date they were swabbed or when it came back positive, um, just because that way for discharge teams and the other teams it's really important so we know if they're on seven days, 14 days and what to do in terms of kind of isolation and that side of things. Um, I'll just take you through to another side which then has it kind of filled in which should make it a bit more clear. So the first bit is your name and your title. Um, so you don't have to write out your full name, you can just say in, for the, in this example FQ. Make sure you write down that you're an F1. Make sure you've got the date, the time. Um, and I tend to find, make sure you've got the age of the patient. It gives a bit more of a clue about where they're at and can be quite useful. Um, next up is the stackard, which we will talk through um, in a little bit. There's an extra C now with the joys of COVID. Um, so we can have a bit of a chat about that as well. Again, the new score is really important to get down, um, especially you know if you've got a consultant or a senior there and they are looking like they've got a bit of a higher news, it's a fab time to kind of properly review them with a the senior. Um, and it sometimes means that you can get a bit more of a plan in place for if they do deteriorate. And also just means that your seniors are aware. So it's, it's a good thing to make sure you've got that down too. So bowel status, again, pretty key, especially in surgery, if they've had a kind of a abdominal operation, something like that, um, make sure you keep an eye on their bowels. Also kind of with the elderly, you need to be using their stool charts. Sometimes patients will go, yes, doctor, I've opened my bowels every day um, at 7 a.m. and it turns out they've not at all and you know they might be a bit confused. So just do make sure you look at the charts, ask the patient and also ask the nursing staff because they tend to know kind of quite well what's going on too. So the plan, as I said, that's probably the most important part really. Um, you need to know what's going to be happening with this patient. Um, I think especially at the weekend or if you know, you're know you chasing something, it's quite nice to have a, if blood's deranged, then do this. Or you know say, um, if blood's normal, can go home tomorrow. It's quite nice to kind of know what will happen if something else happens. It kind of um, predicts it before before it happens if you know what I mean um, so that it kind of means you don't have to call up your senior again and kind of ask what's going on and again again for the weekend or the on-call team they've got a bit more of a clue um, about what to do. So make sure you sign it um, we've all heard the hilarious jokes um, about doctor's handwriting sign it and then just put your initials underneath just so it's clear who you are um, especially if it's a consultant ward around they need to know who's also documented it so just make sure you get that in there um, you'll feel like a little celebrity as well signing everything at first. Right, so I'm just going to work through Stackard, um, very catchy. Um, so this is something that 
um, quite often medical people use, the sort of medical teams use in their notes, um, and it's quite a good way of making sure that you don't miss things. Um, so the S is for swabs, so it's all about MRSA. Um, there's a lovely protocol online, so you don't have to worry about it too much. Um, I believe they need to be swabbed on admission and then kind of every four weeks from then. Um, but again, just kind of check the trust policy or realistically check with the nurses. Um, if they're over 65, they will need um, MRSA kind of prophylaxis. There's a beautiful protocol on EMEDS and you literally just kind of click through and select it all. Um, and I think they're going to be doing that in one of the other talks. Um, so make sure you make use of the protocols there. Okay, so VTE, that's a kind of really important one. So most patients should be on um, VTE prophylaxis. Um, they tend to be less mobile in hospitals. Um, times that we wouldn't do that is you know if they're already on a DOAC, um, if they're already taking warfarin or if it's kind of contraindicated for any way. Um, you need to know their weight, you want to get an accurate weight so that you can give the proper dose. Um, you also need to know their creatinine clearance as this can sometimes um, change the dosage that you need to give. Um, and then also you know if they're not going to be on the injections or something like that then they will need to be on kind of Flotrons or TEDs. Um, but again, make sure you know they've got, not got vascular compromise. But this is, although it sounds complicated, again, it's all on a performer and it's really clear. So you literally just tick it and it'll make it obvious kind of which things you need. Um, the other thing to kind of be aware of as well is how long do we expect them to be on the prophylaxis for? Um, obviously, if some people are post-ops, um, say they've had a neck of femur fracture and they've had it fixed, um, just make sure that you check with the consultants and kind of the local guidelines for how long they'll need to be on it because some people will need to be discharged on home on it and we obviously don't want to miss that. So the next one, A for antibiotics. So oral or IV, um, how long have they been on them? If they've been on them for a little while, what's the plan for stepping them down? Um, we genuinely should be kind of reviewing IV antibiotics every 72 hours anyway. Um, and quite often there might be a plan in place for microbes, so make sure you check that. Um, there, will also, there might also be kind of some swabs that you're waiting for or blood cultures, so make sure that you are kind of chasing them as they can obviously guide whether or not you need different antibiotics. Um, if you are unclear, um, obviously have a chat to the microbiologist, but as a heads up, I would make sure that you know quite a lot about the patient um, because you will be asked quite a lot of questions. Um, online as well, so on the actual Leeds guidelines, there's a fantastic antibiotic, I, I mean it sounds really nerdy saying it's fantastic, but it really, it literally has a picture and you click on the area that you need to treat and it has the full antibiotic guidelines, even if they're penicillin allergic, even if they're, you know, the kidneys aren't working as well, and you can go through it and generally most of your answers are there, so kind of do make sure that you check that before you call, because um, it will have the oral step down and things too. So the second C for catheter, um, so it's really important to find out why they've got a catheter. The amount of patients you kind of sometimes see and you're like, I actually don't really know why they've got a catheter at this moment in time. Um, how long they've had it for, whether it's a long term or a short term. Um, generally on surgical wards, we obviously want to get it out as soon as we can. Um, it tends to be removed when people are mobile and they're opening their bowels. Um, but just as a heads up, it's not necessarily something that needs to delay discharge. Um, there's always um, TWAP clinics that they, patients can go to. Um, and again, you can ask your seniors about whether they think they're going to need it more long term. Um, just a tip as well, if you're putting in a long term catheter, make sure that you keep those stickers and make sure you document it properly. Um, I've had to change numerous long-term catheters because it's not been properly documented um, and obviously it's a bit more of an infection risk. It's really uncomfortable for the patient and it's just another job for you to do. So make sure if you're putting in a catheter you clearly state date, what type of catheter and indication. Um, and obviously if it is difficult to pass write it down because it might kind of give people a heads up for future as well. Right, so the second C is cannula. Um, so have they got one in? Where is it? Why have they got it in? Um, if it's not needed, get it out. It's a source of infection and we need to just make sure we're not, we're kind of removing them when they need to be removed. Um, also make sure that it's patent, it's still flushing. Nurses do tend to tell you if it's not. And also just check around the site so there's no kind of erythema or anything like that. So if you need it, which obviously gives you more reason to remove it. So the third C and a special with this time, I guess, is about the COVID and the COVID status of the patient. Um, it's really important, we say, when the swabs have been done, um, it's really important that you kind of say how many days post positive swab that they have been. Um, as I said before, it helps with the bad managers when they're moving patients, whether they can be moved from a red to a green. Um, and also can mean that you can give advice to families as well. So if patients are being discharged, how long they'd also need to be um, isolated for. Um, another thing as well is some people, some patients are negative, um, but we are treating them as positive because of the way that they've presented. It's really important that you clearly document this because you don't want a patient that you think actually, even though the swab's negative, it's highly likely that they do have it. Moving on to a green ward, obviously that will cause kind of problems um, later on. 
And so the O for oxygen, um, so make sure it's prescribed. There's again a kind of um, performer uh, protocol, sorry, on um, the EMEDs and it's easy and you just click it through. Um, it's really important to get target sats down if you know. Um, at the moment, the current BTS guidelines for, for COVID patients are 92 to 96. Um, but again, this varies, so kind of keep an eye on things as they change. Um, if they've got COPD, don't just assume that they're a retainer. Um, but obviously, if they are 88 to 92 target sats, then make sure you get that down as well. And finally, DNA CPR. So I think there's been quite a lot in the media and stuff at the moment about these kind of end of life decisions. Um, it's really important. It doesn't matter whether it's COVID or non-COVID. We kind of need to know where we're at in terms of escalation for this patient. Um, and it's really, really important for the on-core teams and everything as well. Um, so make sure you've got documented that if there is a DNA CPR, um, if they've got a community DNA CPR, so they've come in with a DNA CPR, you will need to pop it onto their respect form. Um, and I think there'll be another video going through how you do that, um, which is the purple form to make sure it's on the online system and then kind of everyone can see it. Um, also kind of the level of care as well. So kind of of whether they're for level two care, level three care, make sure if you can that's documented too. Um, and also, you know, you're not necessarily going to be having to have these decisions, but if you think it's not being looked at or you think it might have been missed, you're more than within your rights to kind of bring up to the consultant saying, oh, I'm not really sure about the DNA CPR status of this patient. And it may mean that you kind of get one of those conversations in. Um, and the earlier we can have them, the better. Um, and it's kind of better for the patient, the family and kind of outcomes as well there. So the MDT we spoke very briefly about before. Um, it's kind of more at the lunchtime. And as I said, it tends to be kind of a more medical thing that they do. Um, it's great because it means that you've you've got a lot of the MDT members there. So you'll have physio, you'll have OT, you'll have a lot of the nursing staff that are looking after the different patients. Um, and you may also have kind of other teams like palliative and things as well. Um, so it's a great time to ask any of your questions. So if you want someone's input, you can ask them whilst they're there. Um, you can also make sure that if there's any things that you need the nurses to do, so whether that's get an ECG or, um, you know, putting a catheter, things like that, that you can ask them then and there, and it just kind of makes a smoother handover. Um, it's also probably the best time to ask your consultant any questions. If there are things you weren't clear about on the ward round, just ask the question. There is no too stupid question. I promise you will have all probably have asked them. Um, and, you know, it, it's a good chance to get it all clear before they go off. Um, but equally, you know, you are well within your rights to say, if there is a problem, who should I be calling? It might not necessarily be your consultant, but it might be your registrar or you might have another senior and you might want to get their number as well. Um, there's no way you're just going to be expected to kind of run an award as an F1, so don't worry. Um, and, but just make sure you know who to contact if you need. The other thing to mention there as well is about discharges. Um, it's quite good sort of early on if you're thinking medically that you're kind of heading towards discharging patients that you let the nursing team and the other kind of people know. Um, I kind of thought you'd just say, oh, they can go home and they would just magically disappear off home. It's not like that. There's loads of things they need to sort. So the kind of the earlier notice you can give them, the better really. And it just means it's a bit more cohesive um, and it's a bit kind of smoother journey for the patient as well. And no one gets kind of stressed and there's that kind of mad panic for a TTO at the end. So this is just a really quick example of a jobs list. So you've got all the bed numbers down the side. You've got the little um, notes in where you can write the jobs. Make sure it's initials only um, just in case god forbid you do lose it and um, the list is your lifeline it's how you kind of structure your day so make sure you don't um we tend to stick it onto tables and things um there's a little key on the side as well about how you mark whether things have been not done at all requested or done and need to be chased um, and just make sure you keep a tag on things as you go on um some wards so i did a vascular job they actually use the ppm so there's a far column where you can actually put the jobs um some people tend to find that a little bit easier but just make sure that you are keeping it up to date so you avoid kind of duplicating jobs and wasting time. So lunch, definitely a great part of the day. Um, make sure you get off the ward. You don't want to just stay around the ward. Um, on Tuesday, there obviously isn't at the moment, unfortunately, um, but there will be lunchtime teaching available on Tuesdays. It's bleep protected, so it's really, really encouraged that you go. I think you need to get 70% over your F1 to kind of pass as such. Just get it in early. Make sure you go to all of the ones you can. All your friends will be there, and it's a really nice kind of sociable experience as well as highly informative and good for your learning. Um, there might be kind of um, specialty specific teaching, so get involved where you can. I think you have to do a teaching thing um, for your Horus. So if you, you know, early doors do a presentation or something like that, just get it ticked off and get it done. Um, and it's quite good for you as well. I think sometimes when you become an F1, you're like, oh my goodness, I don't know anything. And actually just kind of refreshing a couple of things can make you feel a little bit better. Um, 
so on the LDI, in the LDI um, on floor F there is a rooftop garden which is fab and um, there's also a nearby Tesco and you can get ice lollies um, so you know it's great make sure you do have those breaks there's the cafeteria and jimmies um, and also there's the mess available um, so we can tell you a bit more about kind of joining the mess and where to find the forms and everything um, but essentially they often do kind of free pizza there's always um, toast cereal teas and coffees and just join and get involved with that as well because um, it's so important to kind of have that social and have that balance as well so now is also a great time as well um, there's loads of free food so make sure you keep an eye on your emails they're doing all sorts of kind of bringing food around um, and getting all sorts of bits and bobs so it's it's great if you get involved where you can um, and also it is also a good time you know if you have a supervisor meeting or if you want to get fit tested you can fit those things around your lunch and maybe just come back to the ward a little bit later as long as it's not completely rammed um, and then you can kind of keep things ticking over during your breaks as well so the jobs list so just kind of quickly the main thing with this is make sure you've got everything down um, and make sure you prioritize it when you first start you kind of it'll be a bit unclear as to what things you need to do the more you do the better you get and the more you'll be able to kind of click which job needs to do and really urgently which job can wait a bit obviously as a first and foremost the unwell patients that is who you need to look after the most um, if you have had an absolute stinker of a day and all you have done is just look after really unwell patients and you've not referred someone to a chest clinic in four weeks time that is completely fine your priority is the unwell ones um, and hopefully you should have other colleagues and things around you so they can help with the other kind of less well less important jobs and kind of keep them ticking over but as I said the importance is the unwell patients um, in terms of what next I think kind of scans and referring to specialties probably come of equal importance with referring to specialties you need to get it done before 5 p.m um, it's not an out of hours job so if you need to have a call and have a discussion make sure you do it before then um, there's all sorts of funky ways that you can refer people there's the a to z on the internet and um, there's the acute referral system sometimes you call them um, so you just kind of get used to that as to what you want for each specialty um, it's not particularly clear cut sometimes so just ask we didn't know for ages um, and you just kind of get used to it as you go um, for certain specialties obviously maybe prep a tiny bit before you call you need to know their kind of patient number what they've come in with all those kind of details um, especially kind of the micro and the surgery discussions they will ask you quite a lot of questions um, so just make sure you've kind of got the notes in front of you so it's not as scary um, with scans, so as I said, the way we did it with handover uh, with ward run, sorry, is we tended to have someone scribing and someone with a computer. You can actually or, or, uh, kind of request scans during ward round if you're super on it and you'll get there over time. Um, but you want to really get your scans in, especially the urgent ones, before lunchtime, um, and then you'll need to discuss them with a radiologist too. Um, a really key thing with that is, you know, if a consultant says, right, CT this, you need to know why. What are they looking for? Because that's what the radiologist is going to look is going to ask you. And if you're not clear just ask your consultant um, because it's not a stupid question to need to know why you're requesting what you're requesting um, and just make sure that you've got as much clinical details um, as you can down um, and they tend to be accepted a bit quicker um, bloods is the other thing you know if a discharge if it's a discharge dependent blood or something like that the sooner you get it done the sooner you get the results back and then there's probably more likely going to be someone around to kind of discuss it with so um, if it is abnormal then you've got someone there to help too um, and then all the other jobs you kind of like fit in as and when um, but just try and make sure that you kind of keep a rough structure in your head um, and then make sure you delegate it as well because you you can only do what you can do you can't always complete everything in a day um, but your colleagues and everything you should help out um, so try not to worry too much about that the only final thing on that is discharge summaries as I said you know it does take a little while for the nurses and the pharmacists and stuff to get EDANs done so if you can get them done as soon as you can um, obviously do but just make sure that patients are definitely going home that day it, you know there's no point going crazy and rushing about it if they're not actually going to go home until Friday um, but where possible you know if you do have a quiet minute or you're just having a cup of tea or something try and prep an EDAN if you know the patients it'll be so much easier for you to quickly prep one um, and then it might save the kind of weekend team um, a job and then it's just sort of done and sorted for them. Right, so before going home, so just check all the urgent jobs have, have been done, make sure that you haven't missed anything, um, make sure that all your bloods are out for tomorrow morning, um, as I said before, make sure they're dated. Um, if you know a patient's going to have bloods for kind of every day for a week, you can literally just put out seven blood forms, but just have a different date on top and it'll save you doing it again. Um, make sure you've updated the list, make sure you've got a good handover for the on-call team. Um, remember that the on-call team are the on-call team, they're supposed to be dealing with kind of the unwell patients, so you shouldn't really be handing over just the kind of normal jobs. 
try and get done what you can and if it can wait till tomorrow then sometimes it just has to wait till tomorrow um, and that's okay um, but make sure your handover is clear and you've got kind of as much information as you can because quite often they might not know these people um, so it makes it a bit easier for them and as well just make sure that everyone's okay you know there will be days where it's really hard or it's really stressful or someone you know wants to have a bit of a chat just make sure you do talk and have a chat with your colleagues and things um, because the chances are if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed or stressed they might be too um, and it's quite nice to just have a friend there and just have a bit of a chat so prep for the weekend Woo so friday is as much as it's super exciting because it's the weekend it's also one of the more tiring days because it feels like you've got loads to prep um, so you need to make sure that kind of all the bloods that you want to do are out um, generally on medical wards you tend to have um, you put out like reviews for the weekend um, so these are patients that you're really worried about um, so they need reviewing because they're unwell or patients that might be going home and you don't want to delay their discharge um, on the more surgical wards there tends to be an on-call person for the weekend so actually they will have started on the Friday and they'll be doing Saturday and Sunday too um, so that's kind of a bit more of a smooth handover because they kind of know what's going on and they know the patients a bit better um, so just make sure that if you can the TTAs for those who are going to go home are prepped bloods are out and kind of everyone knows who needs to be reviewed. Um, a big thing is as well, if you're worried about a patient, put them out for review. If you think, if you've got kind of clinical concern, the worst thing you can do is go home and worry about a patient and kind of fret until Monday. Um, even if it's just kind of maybe not putting them out for review, but having a bit of a chat to your reg or just saying, is there anything else I could have done with this patient? You don't want to take your job home. You just want to go and enjoy your weekend um, and go have fun. So make sure that that's kind of all put to bed before you, before you leave. So just the final bit is kind of COVID specific. We kind of have to bring it up in these um, unprecedented times. But the main thing is you're doing fab. What you're doing is so fantastic. It's so lovely that you're coming in kind of before you're even due to start and you're coming to help. Um, things vary day by day you are brand new do not expect to know everything do not expect to have every piece of information that they ask for immediately you're not going to know all the answers and that is completely fine um, you need to ask just ask the question there is no stupid question we're all here to help you and actually it's really nice that you kind of have this period where you are an f1 but you'll also have another f1 with you so you can kind of try things out and ask the questions and come august you guys will be absolutely flying whereas we'll have had multiple stinkers over that time Time, so don't worry about that. Um, wear your PPE, um, make sure that you're fit tested. Your safety is a priority. What you're doing is fab, but we don't want you to get poorly. We don't want you to get unwell. Um, so make sure you're kind of aware of red and green areas. It should be up outside of the wards. Um, and I think you talk to your supervisor in terms of if you do need to be tested yourself um, or if you feel unwell and everything like that. But do just ask those questions um, and kind of ask where they think that you'll be most of most help as well. Um, it might be that there's certain jobs that are more beneficial for you um, and just crack on, get stuck in. Everyone's so thankful, so don't worry about it.